Colossians chapter 1, we're going to continue. I've been preaching a series of messages from Paul's prison letters, and these are the letters that Paul wrote uh, while he was imprisoned. Uh, this will be ultimately uh, unto his death. Uh, Paul, uh, in the letter to Colossae, is writing primarily doctrinally, uh, but also to correct some bad theology, and we'll be getting to that in chapter 2. But we're continuing in chapter 1, and I'm uh, going to look at verses 20 through 23. Verses 20 through 23. And he, which is Jesus, is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell. Preach on that tonight, okay? So those verses I'm preaching tonight. Verse 20. And by him to reconcile all things to himself, by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. And you who were once uh, were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death, to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight, if indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you have heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. I'm going to read also from Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, just a supplemental verse, and look at verses 8 through 11. Romans chapter 5, verses 8 through 11. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Let's pray. Father, I ask you today to help us to understand what reconciliation is and what it means, how it pertains to us, and even the ministry of West Union Baptist Church. Lord, I ask you today to help us to present ourselves and to stand as we are before you, to take any uh, uh, preconceived ideas that we may have and lay them to the side, that the scriptures may search our hearts as we search the scriptures. And Lord, if we're found lacking today, and if we're found in a place where we need to respond to the good news of Christ, that you might bring that conviction and that assurance of our need. And that you might grant the faith that we might look unto salvation to the Lord Jesus Christ, repenting of sin and believing on his perfect work. God, I pray today for the Christians who are struggling. And Lord, those that, that are, are having very difficult times just with life, and I ask you to draw near. That we might gain assurance through the ministry of reconciliation. So, Lord, open our minds and our hearts. Teach us today. Help us to leave here closer to you than we came. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. For those of you that, that like to search uh, or use your uh, electronic devices, there's a wonderful uh, site. Uh, there's, I don't know if they have an app for it, but uh, it's one that I like to go to for definitions. Uh, got questions. I bet some of you use them. I know my daughter does because we've talked about it. But uh, the got questions is a good place to go for some Bible questions. And they had a couple of good illustrations and a definition, and I'm just going to use it because it was better than anything I could write, okay? So they said reconciliation is the restoration of a relationship to a harmonious state after a dispute. It is the bringing of accord out of discord between two parties. So, so reconciliation is, is bringing people back together again who have been separated 
uh, by conflict or ill will or whatever it might be. Christian reconciliation is the work of God through Christ by which he restores mankind to a favorable relationship with himself. Reconciliation, I want you to think about this. We benefit from reconciliation, there's no doubt, because we can be restored through Christ to our relationship with God, a right relationship. But reconciliation is for God. It was a ministry that, that He ordained, and He is the one who began the process by which sinful man might be redeemed and reconciled to Himself. The Got Questions went on to give a great illustration, and this is really the part I wanted to share because I think it's really good. They said Christian re- uh, reconciliation can be illustrated by two erstwhile friends who are now feuding. Do we ever see that? <laughs> feuding friends, okay? The good relationship they once enjoyed is strained to the breaking point. They cease speaking to each other, and the two gradually become strangers. They may even be actively hostile toward one another. But then one day something happens. The two estranged friends begin to talk. Pride and resentment are set aside. Apologies are extended and accepted, and trust is rebuilt. When peace is finally restored and the friends embrace, reconciliation has been achieved. Now, imagine that between these two friends, only one was at fault. And the other friend, totally innocent, is the one who initiated the conciliatory process. That is what Christian reconciliation is like. It is God who is absolutely holy and true and righteous. It is God reaching out to the sinner so that that sinner might be reconciled to him. It is an act of grace. We, I mean, all the songs today were just dead on for the ministry of reconciliation. It is God reaching to us. It is Christ dying for us. It is the beautiful blood of Christ, which is the sacrifice of the Lord, dying for our sins and the penalty for our sin that we might be in this right relationship to the Lord. Now, the first thing, through Jesus, God has reconciled everything to himself. 2 Corinthians 5, 18 and 19 say this, All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. So it is an act of God where we who are at enmity with God, uh, who are opposed to God, might have a way to have our relationship with Him made right. And for that to happen, we have to be made right. And so that begins that ministry of reconciliation. Colossians 1.20 says that Jesus was making peace through His blood shed on the cross. So it's a work of Christ on the cross who paves the way that we might be reconciled unto God. There are four main points to this reconciliation to God through Christ. The first is this, and the first is pretty obvious, by the way. Without God and without His work of grace and mercy, all of humanity is lumped into one category. Alienated, hostile, and engaged in evil activity. So people apart from the Lord, those that have not been reconciled unto God through the ministry of Christ and the gospel, that describes them. All people were alienated. Every one of us in this room, prior to even salvation, we were alienated, hostile, and separated. Now you may say, well, well, I became a Christian as a child. Praise the Lord. That means that God's grace extended to you before you had a chance to make a big mess of your life. And that is a graceful thing. I hope that you had godly parents or godly grandparents who influenced you with the gospel. And there is no greater testimony than the child who's able to say that through the grace of God I became a believer at a very young age and I have followed him faithfully 
all of my life seeking to bring glory to his name and to honor him with my life and my choices and my decisions. Folks, that is a picture of reconciliation for the young child. The child was just as much a sinner as a 70-year-old that has wasted their whole life. We're born unto sin. We're separated from God because of it. And apart from that ministry, we would never, ever have a chance. The second thing, the second thing is that Christ's death on the cross, the blood shed for us, and our trust in Him and trust in what He has done, these two together bring reconciliation to God. Now, when we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, we recognize that I'm a sinner. We recognize that this sin has separated me from God. We look to Christ, who's the one who paid that price and that penalty, and the good news of God that God has given His Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should have everlasting life. We turn from our sinful life and our choices, and we turn to Christ. So we believe upon Him. We repent, which means a change of direction in mind, and our lives begin to live after Him. We respond to what God is doing through His Spirit. But, but I'm telling you, Christ's death and our trust in Him is where this begins. The third thing is, God desires, and this is an act of God's grace, those who are reconciled are to be holy and blameless, above reproach, uh, uh, to, to, to serve the Lord in truthfulness and in life and life. It's not we who do this. It is God who makes us holy. It is God who raises us beyond reproach. Folks, all of us in here that are in Christ know without a shadow of a doubt that I'm still sinning. I still have a capacity to sin. And, and what on earth is going to happen to me? Folks, when you came to Christ, that's what happened to you. You were made uh, free. And I'm going to talk more about that in just a few minutes. The third thing, uh, the fourth thing is that reconciliation in and of itself does require faith. Faith is a gift. We recognize that, but it's a gift that God grants. I believe it's a work of the Holy Spirit as the Lord brings us to that place where we recognize our need for Christ. Folks, the very fact that we recognize that we're dead in our sins tells me that it is God who has quickened us to know that. Because I have never seen something dead react to anything. Have you? So the very fact that, that the spiritually dead can respond to the good news of Christ, that are even interested in the good news of Christ, has to be an act of God. That's why I say reconciliation is what He does. It's not what we do. We're recipients of that ministry, okay? Now, the text tells us very clearly that prior to reconciliation that we were alienated. That means that, that, that we were not a part of anything holy anything of God. We were completely separated from all of His grace and all of His goodness. We were estranged. We were estranged. And we also were separated. So alienated, estranged, and separated. By what? What is it that has caused this rift, this, this divide, this, this, this chasm, if you will? What caused that? Our sin. As a matter of fact, I believe I could sum it up with the word sin. The word sin. The Bible says that, that, that all who have sinned are separate from God. The Bible teaches that all have sinned. The Bible teaches that we were born into sin. And there's some debate of, of well, is an is a innocent baby a sinner? The, the nature of sin is in that baby. But if you have a big problem with that, I can assure you that just as soon as that child's able to, it's going to sin. It's going to lie. It'll steal. It'll do anything it can. I know, I know we want to think children are, are, are very innocent, but I remember uh, uh, Adrian Rogers uh, preaching a message one time, and he talked about the baby crying in the bed and realized his parents will come. And so when there's nothing wrong, there's not a dirty diaper, they're not hungry, they just cry because they want mom or daddy to come. It's a lie. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with them. They've learned and they've been conditioned to do that. I know that's stretching it, but I thought it was a good illustration. And so we recognize that. If you've ever told a child not to do something, uh, that's a pretty well guarantee that they're going to give it a shot, isn't it? Okay. So we're alienated, estranged, and separated by sin. The second thing is that the, the text tells us that we're enemies in our minds by wicked 
works. We're hostile minded. Now listen, I want you to just think for a minute. Just rationally think for a minute. Does it make any sense? Does it make any rational sense whatsoever that unredeemed man who, who doesn't believe in God, sees no need to have God in their life, who has by a choice rejected God, they may be atheists, they may be, uh, they, there's all kinds of terms we use, but, but just simply dot not interested in a creator. Okay? Have you ever noticed how hostile people are toward God, toward His mercy and His grace, toward Christ and Christianity and the church? Have you ever noticed that? And does it make any rational sense? Think about that for just a minute. You cannot go, Tracy and I watched a movie the other day that we thoroughly enjoyed. Uh, uh, we were very selective on kind of what we said, not because we're holier than thou, but just don't want trash, and I can't stand to hear the name of the Lord our God blasphemed and mocked. And we watched a movie, and I told Tracy, I said, and that was a movie probably from the 90s. I don't remember when it was written, but, but I said it was so refreshing to watch a, a, a goosebump love story without a curse word, without the name of the Lord our God brought in into condemnation, and to recognize that Hollywood has rejected God, but they go out of their way to curse the name of God. Why is that? Does it make any sense whatsoever? I mean, I live in the world. I live just like you do. I've never seen in the world, I do hear bad words and cursing and all that, but I've never heard the blasphemy of the name of God like I do in a one-hour program. We screen all the curse words, or not, I don't think they do now, but they, would, they got to where they screened every curse word but the Lord's name condemned. They allow that. It just makes no sense. It makes no sense in the hatred. It makes no sense in the rejection. Christian, what makes you a Christian is your belief in the Lord Jesus Christ and your faith in Him and your acknowledgement to seek to obey God out of love to Him, which means we seek to obey the Word of God. The world doesn't understand that. They're never going to understand that because they don't understand what that relationship involves and the love that is between us and our Creator. But they reject us following Scripture. It makes no sense. The only thing that can explain it, whether it's acknowledged or not, and I don't have a problem whether they say I'm crazy, it has to be an open hostility toward God, a rejection of His rightful place as creator of the universe. As a matter of fact, Romans tells us very clearly that although everything that we can know about God when it comes to His power and his ability is seen in those things created. Man has said he didn't do it. He didn't do anything. Everything we have that we enjoy just happened. It was, it was, it was, it just happened. It'd be like a hurricane coming through here, and when it was finished, we have a new sanctuary out there. Through all the chaos, it built us a sanctuary. It's never gonna happen. But we we accept it. To me, that just speaks to the hostile-minded lostness of a world that is not reconciled to God. Now, after we're reconciled, after we're reconciled, we're no longer at enmity with God. So, so where we had rejected Him and where we stood apart from Him and against Him and even being hostile to Him, that's gone. We're no longer ungodly. Our lifestyle is going to be to honor Him, to recognize Him, to give gratitude to Him and thanks, to honor Him with our life and our speech and our minds and our voices and our lives and our homes and the influences that we have over others. Everything that we want to do is to bring glory and honor to Him. Now listen to this one. After salvation, hold on to this. You're no longer a condemned sinner. You've been declared righteous. It's an act of God through faith in Christ. And for that matter, you're no longer powerless 
to live a life enslaved to the world and to Satan and to sin. You've been given power through the work of the Holy Spirit to walk a life and to live a life that can honor the Lord. In short, you've been made a new creation when you've been reconciled to God. That is the ministry of reconciliation. The Bible says that we're holy, which means we're consecrated to God. That means we've been set apart. Now, I would say that it means we're special. And I know everybody likes to be special. Uh, I want to be special to God. Well, you already were special to God. Holiness is so much bigger than that. Holiness is a sanctification that sets us apart and makes us choice uh, instruments in the life and the hand of our God. Not only are we holy, our text tells us we're blameless. Blameless. That means innocent of wrongdoing, period. Blameless. Do you live and feel sometimes like you're blameless? How many in here would say, I kind of have a hard time with that sometimes. I can mess my life up and make bad choices and, and, and just run things in the dirt quicker than anything. Anybody acknowledge that? I know I can. I know I can. One unkind word, one inflection of voice, one moment of irritability, one moment of letting our, our, our guard down and allowing something to have a place, I always like to say a foothold, and invite Satan to come and have a heyday with us. It's a constant battle, isn't it? But after reconciliation, the Bible says that we're blameless. That means we're innocent of any wrongdoing. After reconciliation, our text tells us that we're above reproach in his sight. Now, what does that mean? That's a big word. Reproach. I don't use that a lot when I talk to people. What does it mean to be above reproach in his sight? That means as I stand before the Lord today, in Christ, I stand before him without a single fault at all. Ooh, really? <laughs> that doesn't seem possible. We couldn't do it. We trust in the one who could. And that's Jesus Christ through his ministry of reconciliation. Now, there's evidence of true reconciliation. So the, the, to me, the foundational truth is this. Am I reconciled unto God or am I not? Because if I'm reconciled unto God, then holy, blameless, and above reproach is what's declared upon me through the work of Christ in my life. But how do I know that I'm reconciled? I mean, I mean, I don't feel blameless. I don't feel above reproach. I don't feel holy. How can I know this? I mean, how can I examine this? Well, our text gives us a couple of things to consider, three things. If indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel, continuity in the Christian life, continuity in the life of faith. Folks, look, if, 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 if something's alive, it has motion. If something's alive, it has an ability to sustain and to move. And when we're made alive in Christ, the life that is in us, think of it as being engrafted to the vine. The life that is in us is granted to us through God. The fruitfulness that we, uh, uh, that we participate in or that is a result of that union is His life in us, but we are moving. We're continuing. And I'm telling you, one of the great evidences of salvation, it isn't, well, I made a decision or I joined the church or I was baptized or, or uh, I said a prayer. Those all may be involved in some of that. But the evidence of reconciliation is, is that I am found in faith and I continue in faith. It's not lip service. It wasn't a moment. When Jesus gave the parable of the seeds, some of the seeds 
there was the seed that found the fertile soil and it and it grew and it was fruitful and it and it represented the life that's grounded in Christ that is uh, been reconciled. That's that's the illustration of that. But there was another one. There was a couple. There was, there was four different scenarios. But there was one where the seed sprang up. It it, it had initial life. Uh, it, it, it would be those that join the church, that are baptized, that are excited, but there's no root. And as soon as any difficulty in life comes, they fall by, the, they're gone. They shrivel up and they die. Folks, a plant that shrivels up and die was never planted and rooted in Christ because the life that we live is His, not ours. So, so it's evidence of this. Reconciliation is a continuity. We continue in the faith. The second thing is this. We're grounded and we're steadfast. In other words, we're not easily moved. When something is grounded, it has something to hold on to. It, it's rooted. Uh, it's foundation. It's solid. If you're building your life on your decisions and your choices and your ideas, you are not biblically grounded. There's not a supernatural act in your life that's holding you. It's what you're doing. It, it, it's just not going to work. Imagine you have a big old fancy four-wheel drive, and you're out driving in some not really great places, some mud and, and some water, and all of a sudden you feel that thing start to bog down. Now you have a little lever that can go to four high or four low, and you could reach in there and you could utilize what you have, but you get the bright idea, hey, something's happening here. I'm going to get out and I'm going to push my truck out of this. Now, wouldn't that just be foolish? You, you may get stuck, but it'd be crazy to think that you have an ability to do more than the machine that was built to do the thing, within reason, of course. It'd be a lot easier to just shift that thing in four low slow down and just let the vehicle gear itself and pull itself through. My brother used to have a little Suzuki Samurai. Some of you will remember those. You gotta be kinda old to remember these. It's like a miniature Jeep, like a miniature Jeep Wrangler. And uh, he had buckshot mutters. Some of you will know what that is. Many of you will not. Well, when you drove it, you just heard wrong, 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 those old buckshot mutters. I took that little Jeep mud ride one day. It had a, a soft top. I'd taken the top off of it. And I took a man from my church with me, an elderly man. And we went out to, um, um, we called it Devil Swamp. I don't know what they call it now, but uh, uh, there's some old mud roads that people like to ride down. And I took it right down that road. And Gary and I were riding back there and, and we had gone through some pretty good stuff. We had already, it was an older, you had to lock the hubs on it. And we'd already done all that. And we got to a hole, and I looked at it, and Gary said, uh, Preacher, I don't think we should go through that one. I said, ah, we'll make it. We've gone through everything. That thing had such a short wheelbase, it, it was between the ruts that everybody else had made. So it, would just, it just amazed me. And so in a moment of foolishness, I looked at the hole, and I didn't know how deep it was, so I just took off. And I kept going until the water came over the hood. And I kept going until the water came over the doors. And it was flooding the inside of my little brother's brand new truck. But guess what? It never quit going. That little sucker came out of that water. And when we had to open the doors, and it was a mess. I had to clean it. <laughs> Unfortunately, I had folded the top and put it on the back floorboard. So you can imagine what it looked like. But I had so much respect for that little truck after that day. I'm glad I didn't tear it up. I brought it back to him somewhat clean. But folks, sometimes we get the idea that in our own power, we can live this life, and we can't. We've got to be grounded and steadfast into what God is doing. God is able. We are not, okay? And the third thing is an evidence. We're continuing the faith. We're grounded and steadfast. And we're not easily moved away from the hope of the gospel. As a matter of fact, it's all we got. You ever heard somebody say, if, if you died today and you stood before the Lord and he said, why should I let you into my heaven? Why should I let you into heaven? Now, that's not going to happen that way. Just so you know, it's a terrible illustration. 
But, but if you stood before him, or if I stood before him, if I died today, and I stood before the Lord and I heard that question, do you know what my only answer will be? I cling to Christ. That's all I've got. I have nothing else. I'm not worthy. Nothing I've done is worthy. I could preach a thousand years and it would not make me worthy to be in the presence of Almighty Holy God. Not just holy God, holy, holy, holy God. So the only hope that I have is Christ. That would be my answer. But I already know that's the answer because the Bible declares it. Okay? So how does reconciliation occur? That's even found in our text here, by the way. Now I want you all to listen real closely here. Paul said the gospel was preached and proclaim to every creature under heaven. So the good news of Jesus Christ has been proclaimed. People have heard the good news of Christ. So how do people hear the gospel? How do people hear the gospel? I just said it. It's preached. It's preached. That's what Paul said. So how are you reconciled? The gospel was preached and proclaimed to you and you heard the good news of Christ and you responded to it. Now we know that that response is birthed in a new birth and a new heart and belief in Christ and faith. We know that all this is a gift of God. We know that it is the spirit that quickens. We understand all that. But all this is predicated upon the premise that the gospel is preached. So, so how will they hear if there's no one to preach? And how would they know? I'm telling you guys, if I could figure, if, if I would have been the one in charge of salvation, and I'm not, I don't think that I would have based it all upon the proclamation of man to man. Because we tend to mess things up. Which led to the third thing that Paul surmised. He said, I wish I was called to be a minister. Listen to me. God calls men to preach the gospel. Don't preach this enough. Do you know that we're having a shortage of preachers right now? I think I know why. It's not easy. People who look at the ministry as a career are going to be disillusioned. You learn quickly that sheep have teeth. And they bite. Sometimes people think it's not worth it. If, if you come into it with a mindset that this is my career and I want to excel at it, you will be miserable in the ministry. As a matter of fact, when people tell me that I feel God may be calling me to the ministry, there's a joy in my heart followed by a sorrow in my heart. I understand that. You probably won't because it's a life of sacrifice and it's a life of service. But I'm telling you something, folks. Listen to me. We may have some young men here today that God is calling to go into the ministry. I've had people ask me, how did you know that God calls you to go into the ministry? Well, I didn't until I got a little bit older. When I graduated high school, I was headed to Ole Miss. I had a full ride. I wanted to be a doctor. Entered in pre-med. Had no desire to preach, I can assure you, zero. Zero. And I was Christian, but I had my life planned out. And things began to change. And the Lord began to change direction and ideas and motives in my heart. And I remember when the Lord called me to go into the ministry. And I remember questioning that. Nobody else knew I was going through that. I was praying. I didn't talk to my preacher about it. I didn't talk to my youth minister about it. Uh, I was a young adult. I felt like I had outgrown the youth department. I wanted to be a young man. But I wanted to be obedient to God. And I didn't have somebody I knew that I could talk to. Now, in hindsight, I could have gone and talked to my pastor. But I didn't know what to say. I didn't know how to ask. I didn't know what was going on. And so I just prayed about it. And then one night, a retired preacher handed me a verse. At the, and during a revival, and he said, I just feel like the Lord wanted you to have this. And it was a scripture from the Old Testament. And the simple words 
were this, have I not called you? Be of courage. Became my faith verse, Joshua 1, verse 9. Never dreamed that I'd have the privilege to stand behind a holy desk and proclaim God's word to be a part of the ministry of reconciliation. But that's how it's done. And if you think about it, the whole Bible is a story of reconciliation. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18 through 21 says this, Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him when you start in the garden of Eden you have a perfect relationship and a perfect fellowship between God and his created people and for that matter between his people and God and creation everything is in perfection and then what happened sin sin there was no shame there was no guilt there was no remorse because it was perfect but then sin entered the picture and what happened then all the relationships were severed there was animosity between Adam and Eve this woman you gave me <laughs> The man blamed her. We're still doing that, aren't we, guys? <laughs> oh, if you live with this woman, you'd understand. And she would say, oh, if you live with this man, you'd understand. <laughs> After sin entered the world, man began to seek their own way, living apart from God, openly hostile. The Bible says that we are living at enmity with God. And then we look at Scripture from Genesis to Revelation, and we see God act. We see Him act. Man ran away from God. God pursued us. We were scattered as sheep. God sent the good shepherd. We hid in the dark. God sent a great light, the true light. We were dying. We were dying. Thirsty for that relationship with God. And God sent the living water. Every Sunday, and for that matter, every Wednesday and every opportunity that I have to stand behind any place behind the Word of God and to proclaim, I am imploring people to be reconciled to God. You've heard the gospel this morning. You've heard the good news of Jesus. The Bible says that God draws us to Christ. Christ, in turn, saves us and brings us to the Father. And it's the Holy Spirit who convicts us of that need. There's nothing I do. I just proclaim it. God's the one that runs with it and does it. So my question is this, are you reconciled to God? And is there evidence that true reconciliation has taken place? And if not, why not now to make that right? Let's bow together. Father, thank you for the ministry of reconciliation. Thank you in your wisdom, in your foreknowledge, in your awesome love for us that you've provided a way. Lord, I praise you for this and I thank you. 
And Father, I ask you, I ask you today that you would speak to our hearts. That you would speak to our hearts so clearly that we would not assume anything, but that we might know that we've been reconciled unto you. Sin will always separate. Sin will always destroy. Sin always brings death. And unless we've been set free from sin, the evidence is right there. But Lord, you convict us of that. So we look for that conviction. We look for the fact, Lord, that you reach into our heart and bring us to the place where we recognize our need to come as we are to Christ for cleansing, for forgiveness, for restoration, for reconciliation. So, Lord, as we have this time of appeal, we stand bare before you with no pretenses. And we only ask you, Lord, during this time, show us our heart. Show us where we are. Show us whose we are. And give us faith to cry out to you if there's that need. And we will give you praise and honor and glory for that. And I ask and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.